Good afternoon. I'm Gary Kasparov, chairman of Human Rights Foundation. And um, I'd like to introduce a very brave woman who became a symbol of resistance against dictatorship, not only in her native Belarus, but all around the world. Let's start from the very beginning. Um, your unexpected entry into political life. Uh, your husband last year decided to challenge Belarusian dictator Alexander Lukashenko, who stayed in power for God knows how many years, 26 years. And then he was arrested, which is again common practice among dictators. But then something unexpected happened. You decided to step in. So tell us, it's the, what were your thoughts, emotions behind this very courageous decision? Uh, you know, I understand it's not really a current decision, but at that moment uh, I made it only for love to my husband because who, he was doing uh, such a great job. You know, he showed people the truth. He asked people about their lives. And I wanted to show him that he is important to me. What he's doing is important to me. So he was jailed. He didn't have an uh, opportunity to run for presidency. And I brought my documents instead of him. At that moment, I was sure that Central Election Commission will not accept my documents because they knew who uh, I am, but they did. They wanted to make love at me. They were sure nobody would vote for housewife without any political experience. And who knows, maybe it was the worst mistake um, okay, but uh, the next stage, as you said, you didn't expect the documents to be accepted, but they did uh, receive the documents and they wanted to uh, make you kind of, you know, just uh, an easy target for, for uh, a match of dictator. So to the contrary, so you run a campaign with two other brave women, with uh, Valeria Tsepkalo and Marie Kolesnikova, who is, as probably you know now, who's sentenced for 11 years in jail so, um, for the crime of challenging Luka, Lukashenko, and uh, her sister Tatiana is with us in this audience. So tell us about this creative campaign. Three women against the match dictator. And so what happened and how you managed to rally support of hundreds of thousands, no, no, millions of people who gave you their votes and gave you overwhelming victory in the elections? Uh, you know, yeah, it was really powerful trio, and it happened unexpectedly for everyone. We haven't known other before. Uh, but, you know, we uh, didn't have illusions about uh, elections. We uh, understood that elections will be fraudulent. It only was a Soviet ritual. No one really uh, counts votes. But team of Babadika, uh, they uh, invented uh, alternative, uh, alternative counting of votes. And we were sure that uh, with the help of uh, this fact that we see that uh, real numbers, uh, you know, we will make regime understand that technology came to our life, that we can prove that elections were fraudulent. And, uh, and during this pre-election campaign, uh, not only me or two women uh, mobilized, all the Belarusians uh, mobilized. And it was like about dignity of people. About people woke up, they understood how many of us, people for like the first time for 27 years, so eyes each other. They saw that there are millions of us who want changes and we stopped um, uh, discussing politics and regime in the kitchens behind the closed doors, but uh, discuss this openly and freely, and it was uh, like ex like explosion in in society. And but everything was grassroots. Uh, people organized themselves. There was uh, no one uh, ruler who told let organize this, let organize that. People did everything by themselves, and we were on the part uh, of this uh, movement. Okay, so dictator lost elections. So th th there were different mathematical um, uh, formulas to, to that have been used to actually uh, uh, trying to calculate your result, which ranged, I think, from something 55 to 
but it, it was definitely a majority of votes that, that, uh, were, that were cast, was cast to support you. So rigging elections for dictators, common practice. But something unexpected happened again. Hundreds of thousands of people fill the streets of Minsk and other cities in Belarus for weeks, for months, protesting, demanding the Lukashenko to step down. He didn't. So, um, and it's, it was quite unfortunate, but this massive protest, I think we, we saw that 70% of the country, if not more, supported you and wanted election results to be recognized. Why this first phase of revolution in Belarus failed? I think, first of all, that you call it the first uh, phase of revolution because some people uh, often say that revolution failed. But you're correct, the first phase failed. Uh, maybe it, it, it isn't failed, maybe it's uh, transformed into another form of revolution. Uh, but it was oppressed only because of uh, uh, violence and tortures in the others. You know, we really underestimated the cruelty of the regime. We were sure that uh, there were hundreds of thousands of people on the streets uh, show regime that, you know, people have changed. Uh, we are ready for changes. We want get rid of the regime. We want better future for our lives. But regime decided differently. They uh, decided to use all the violence, all the possible violence against people. Since August, more than 35,000 people have been detained. Uh, thousands of political prisoners at the moment. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands had to flee the country because of repressions. So regime wanted, with the help of uh, tortures, make people love or like uh, regime again. But they failed, it's not us who failed. We transformed uh, our resistance. So you telling us that resistance continues. The people That's of not Belarus, not. they are not going to accept the brutal murderous rule of, of Lukashenko. So we saw recently one of these, one of the examples, uh, the programmer, Arkady Zolso, who was active online, you know, uh, uh, posting blogs and just, you know, being engaged uh, uh, proactively in, in spreading word about uh, crimes of the regime. He had been targeted by Lukashenko police and uh, KGB officers in civilian clothes tried to enter his apartment and arrest him. So he fought back. He shot and killed one of the intruders. And of course he was uh, uh, killed by overwhelming fire. I believe he was a hero. So tell us about this new stage of resistance when people are so desperate that they just, you know, they don't want just to be arrested and tortured and harassed and they want to fight back. Uh, you know, in the country where there is absolute um, absence of law, where you don't know who is uh, behind your doors, policemen or, you know, robbers, or who are these people in civil uh, courts, as you see, uh, people are desperate. They know uh, that in the, in the jail, for sure, if those people are behind the doors, they will be jailed and they will be tortured there and all the family will be the target of these people. People, uh, as you said, they are desperate. They are ready to... Uh, defend themselves in different ways. Some, uh, some uh, choose leave the country, some choose hide uh, somewhere, but not to be in jail. And, and this uh, hero, he chose uh, another way, but we really don't know the peculiarities of this situation. We have seen only one version, uh, the version of uh, this shooter. But of course I have to say that it's strategy, tragedy, where we have two victims. And, uh, you know, only regime is guilty in this situation, uh, not Andre for sure. And uh, we must assure that uh, proper investigation will happen uh, according to this situation. Uh, you know, but it, of course it's horrible uh, situation, you know. Uh, um, okay, but now, um, the situation on the ground in Belarus is, 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 is horrible and Lukashenko shows no signs of making any concessions. It's getting worse and worse. Now, what about the rest of the world? 
So we heard many words, blah, 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 that's, you know, condemnations. Do you think that international community, let's first talk about the leadership, the leadership of free world, has been doing enough to put pressure on Lukashenko with sanctions and other uh, acts that could weaken the regime? Uh, I really believe that uh, European society and USA and UK want to do uh, a lot to help Belarusian people. But it's a pity that uh, institutions, organizations that uh, work in the democratic societies uh, can't work properly with the uh, dictatorships. But it doesn't mean that uh, we should stop. Belarusian people can't stop because we have no choice. And I think that uh, European society also have to be um, creative, they have to be stronger, braver in taking uh, decisions. And of course, we need three ma major things. Uh, we need solidarity, first of all. We need um, pressure on the regime and we need justice. Because solidarity is important to keep uh, and people uh, continue they resist. We need assistance to media and civil society. We need access to internet, we need anti-censorship tools, and we need uh, Belarus on the agenda. And uh, it's also important to look into future Belarus, and uh, MACRA aid that was proposed by Europe was very well accepted by Belarusians, I mean, comprehensive plan for Belarus. But, but, it's a pressure, yeah. yeah it's but, a pressure. But, yeah, good, go ahead, it's a pressure. Yeah, I want to hear, you know, what, what is to be done, because right now, again, we, it's a lot of, you know, wishful thinking. What is to be done? Tell us. So, diplomatic and targeted sanctions. Sanctions work. Sanctions allow uh, uh, to split elites. Sanctions uh, uh, stop, uh, you know, stop businesses to deal with Lukashenko. Because after a uh, full package of sanctions, we started to receive uh, phone calls from businesses that are around Lukashenko just asking how can we help you, uh, how can we avoid sanctions. So businesses don't want to share responsibility with the regime for the crimes they committed. So um, don't uh, let the uh, regime to abuse international uh, institutions. Like uh, some people are uh, stopped by police in different countries because Interpol uh, because regime is used in, in full uh, on this regard. And of course, we should um, recognize the regime as criminal, because what's going on in Belarus is uh, uh, terrorism, terrorism against uh, nation. So we have, used every, we have to use every institution, just maybe a little bit more creative that you are used to, used to do, but, uh, you know, the situation is not conventional, and maybe we have to uh, use non-conventional approach. Svetlana is very diplomatic, so I should not be. Yeah, and she talks about creativity. It's about political will. It's about to overcome political impotence of the free world. They can ruin Lukashenko regime. When, and by the way, the regime, you know, as they talk, Lukashenko receives you know, help from Putin. And while you know, they say Putin is too dangerous, he has nuclear weapon. Lukashenko does not have it. And the sanctions, unfortunately, we all know. Again, you're diplomatic, I understand why. But it's just, you know, it's, it's a joke. It's they, they could, they should, they, and I hope they would do something to ruin Lukashenko regime. But it's, but it's not only. This is not only about, about leadership of the free world. It's not only about business community. It's also about media. CNN, you hear, you're listening to us. What about the shameful interviews with Lukashenko? How on earth you could call him Mr. President? It's a murderous dictator. By calling him Mr. President, you ignore the will of people of Belarus. The words, the words matter. The words matter, and again, you know, uh, we should thank President-elect of Belarus, Svetlana Tikhanovska, for joining us at Oslo Freedom Forum. Thank you very much, Svetlana. Thank you. Thank you.